In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Saint Joseph, Vicar of the Holy Spirit, in fulfilling the duties of your wonderful, wonderful marriage with Mary, introduce the Holy Spirit to my will in order to ignite it with God's holy love. Present my will to the Most Holy Trinity, so that my desires may always be at God's disposal. Offer my heart to God, so that he may dwell in it as on a throne of love and mercy. Present the movements of my soul and all the affections of my heart to God, so that through your intercession I will always be faithful to the grace and inspirations of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, on this day eight of our consecration to St. Joseph, we ask you once again to pour out your Holy Spirit upon us as we dive deeper into the person of St. Joseph and why he is so great. Cover us with his holy cloak as a place of refuge for us. Help us in our own personal lives and our, for deeper conversions, for blessings upon our relationships, for everything that we're going through, especially for our loved ones who are away from the faith. We ask for conversions through the intercession of St. Joseph. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today is day eight. And uh, finally, we're actually got a title that has St. Joseph in it. So now we're going to get into, you know, the specific stuff dealing with St. Joseph. So on day eight from the litany, it's just simply St. Joseph, pray for us. And I've got this phenomenal quote from St. Pope Pi uh, Paul VI. That is there, again, it's another doctoral dissertation quote. If you wanted to do a dissertation, doctoral dissertation, this would be the money quote. You could do so much research on this. He says this, we see that at the beginning of the New Testament, as at the beginning of the Old, there is a married couple. But whereas Adam and Eve were the source of evil, which was unleashed on the world, Joseph and Mary are the summit from which holiness spreads all over the earth. The Savior began the work of salvation by this virginal and holy union. Drop the mic. I mean, what? He... That is so profound. I mean, not only does he say that Mary and Joseph lived a virginal marriage, which means that Joseph was a virgin, not a widow. We'll get into that later. I mean, this is a pope saying this, not Father Calloway. You know, this is this is serious stuff here. And he's talking about the seriousness of marriage, that it's at the beginning of the New Testament and the Old Testament. And, you know, if you think about it, that's what Satan went after. Satan hates marriage. So he went after, he attacked marriage at the beginning of creation with our, our, our first parents, Adam and Eve. And they, you know, jacked it up. And now, you know, we're, we're living the, this, this thing out. But our new parents, Mary and Joseph, are the summit from which holiness spreads all over the earth. And you know what he's kind of saying there? And you have to be careful here. But he's kind of saying that St. Joseph is the new Adam. Now, why do I say you have to be careful there? Because ultimately, it's Jesus Christ. And we, we know that. Jesus is the cornerstone, the foundation. Uh, he is the new Adam, Jesus Christ. He's the, the, the renewer of, of, of our faith. He's the one who takes us to the Father. So he is the uh, new Adam. And that's clear in, in the first letter to the Corinthians. Very clear, very clear. So I want to make say that right up front. But what the Pope is saying is that Joseph can be considered like a new Adam, not the new Adam, that's Jesus Christ, but like a new Adam because he's the father of a new humanity. He's in many ways greater than the first Adam and certainly greater than any that came after him, even great, great ones. I mean, you think about it, like Abraham and so many others who, you know, God made covenants with and said, your children were being more numerous than the stars of the heaven. Right. But think about Joseph and what, what he did. And so we see in the marriage of Mary and Joseph kind of a, what many of the early church fathers talked about, like St. Irenaeus talked about this recapitulation. And they always talked about it with, with, with Mary and Jesus, and rightly so. And, right, and pri that's primarily first. That's what primarily means, always the case. But now, if you think about Joseph, what about Joseph? He's in there. And he, he's the one, he, he, in a certain sense, 
is the one who made the path ready for Jesus Christ to, to fulfill that role as the new Adam. It's pretty insightful stuff, and you, you could unpack it. So this is what, you know, he, he's kind of getting at. But you have to be careful. You don't want to supplant Jesus and, and give, give that role to Joseph because that would be incorrect. It's all about Jesus Christ, always. But we can't deny that Joseph's place was very important. And so often, pretty much for 2,000 years now, has been overlooked and undervalued and not really brought into this in, in, a, in a big way. Okay. St. Joseph, oh, okay, so I say it right here. St. Joseph is, after Christ, the new head of the human family. He really is, after Christ. Really insightful stuff. And again, somebody could do a doctor dissertation on this and maybe dig through the fathers of the church and their obscure writings and see if any of them mention Joseph in this way. Or then you can get into the medieval saints and mystics and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then bring it up to, you know, the, the Renaissance and modern times and maybe crescendoing with this quote from uh, St. Pope Paul VI. Now, I'll give this little statement, and then we'll get into the reading for today, because the reading is one of those longer ones. We have about 10 readings in the book from that second section that are a little longer than the others. I didn't want it. It's not ideal, because some of them are shorter. Some of them are longer. Uh, it's just the way that it is, because I didn't want to neglect some really meaty stuff that we have to cover. So I say here that um, the greatest thing that any father can do for his children is to help them get to heaven. See, this is so important because it's not about you trying to get your children a scholarship. Not that that's bad. Or it's not fatherhood is not about trying to get your boy to be an all star or about trying to get your your son into some you know Ivy League college or whatever, that, not that there's anything necessarily wrong with that, although there kind of is today, because most of those schools are completely jacked up. You wouldn't want to waste your money sending your children to those kind of schools. I mean, they got <laughs> crazy thoughts going on in there. Um, but, you know, this, or, or, or even to be, you know, somebody famous or, 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 or well-known or, 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 or something like that. No, it's about helping them to achieve the, their ultimate end, which is the beatific vision. And you can play a part in that by your modeling, you know, Christian life and, and, and a virtuous life. And that's what fatherhood is about. It's what, obviously, motherhood is about, too. Our first father, Adam, ruined this possibility for all his children. Our first father's disobedience caused the downfall of all creation and kept us from entering heaven. St. Joseph's fatherhood, on the other hand, elevates us and helps us to enter heaven. He loves us, helps us become saints, and brings us to the only path that leads to heaven, Jesus Christ. That's what St. Joseph wants for us, because he's a good father, and that's what he strives to do for us. And what this consecration uh, can help bring about is our closeness to him brings us closer to Jesus, the only way to heaven. Okay, so let's go to page 85 where I start with a quote on the delight of the saints from St. Maximian Kolbe. You know, St. Maximian Kolbe has phenomenal writings, incredible writings. And he does have some stuff on St. Joseph. Not a lot, but he does. Um, and his stuff was only um, translated officially into English in what they call the critical edition. So, you know, the official one that's been thoroughly studied and um, put together in two huge volumes. I mean, those puppies are like this thick each. And they only came out maybe, I think about four years ago in English, the totality of his writings. And some of them are just little notes. They're not very long, but they collected them in two huge books and you can buy, buy those. So I went through those when I was putting this book together to get some stuff from St. Joseph. And I got this quote, because uh, who doesn't love St. Maximian Kolbe, right? I mean, that guy's amazing. He says, with the exception of our loving mother, St. Joseph stands above all the saints. All the saints. Wow. Now, there are a ton of saints from the beginning of the church, fathers of the church. Many of them are doctors of the church, which means that their teaching has perennial value. It's timeless. It's just so important. You know, this is why they're doctors of the church. Many of them will actually say, 
that St. Joseph is the, is, is the greatest saint of all. So if you notice, St. Maximilian Kolbe says he's the greatest of, of, of all the saints after Mary. Important distinction. But many of the, of the saints will say that St. Joseph is the greatest of all the saints. And they leave Mary out. They, they don't mention her. So, for example, I have a quote from another you know, doctor of the church, St. Gregory Nazianzen. He says, the Almighty has concentrated in St. Joseph as in a son of unrivaled luster, the combined light and splendor of all the other saints. Now, what's up with that? Because this is important for the book, because you're going to read many quotes in this book that talk about something similar to that. And you could think, wait a minute, are they saying that St. Joseph is greater than the Blessed Virgin Mary? Because she's a saint, right? So what's up with that? Or how, how are we to understand that? Well, here's how, how you're to understand it. In the early church, Mary, our Blessed Lady, was thought to be so special, though a creature, but so special and so holy that they considered her in an entirely different category of sanctity. She was called the All-Holy One, the All-Holy Theotokos, the God-bearer. Um, and they didn't even really call her a saint. Like you wouldn't see the word saint in front of her name. And you still to this day, you really don't see that in Catholicism. In Protestantism, you will, because they, you know, they got they got a whole bunch of errors they're working with there. They don't understand it in the same way and not in the right way. They have tons of, you know, truths, obviously, because they're Christian, but they're off a little in some of their understandings of things, these things. And this is one of them. So like in Catholicism, it's almost unheard of for you to hear somebody, whether it's a pope, priest, bishop, layperson, referring to Mary as Saint Mary. It just doesn't happen in conversations. But you will hear, learn about buildings, like this is Saint Mary's parish in whatever, or Saint Mary's hospital, or Saint Mary's parochial school, or Saint Mary's whatever, you know, for buildings and things like that. Oh, sure, we have tons of those in Catholicism. But if you are talking to Catholics in their everyday speech, conversation, or pious practices, we do not say Saint Mary. Is it because we're saying that she's not a saint? No, we're saying that she's like super saint. She's got her own category here. She's the all holy one. She's the Immaculata. She's in a distinct category. She's not God. Catholic Church has never said that and never will because it's not true. But she is so holy that she's, she's next level holiness, next level holiness. So if you notice, I know a lot of people who are converts. Uh, many of them have been former Protestant pastors, good people, great people. They love the Lord. And, and then they, you know, the Holy Spirit really gets them and they get the fullness of the truth and they enter the Catholic Church. But still, some of them sometimes will, you'll, you'll find them. I, I, I know I do. They'll still say St. Mary. And that's just that's that's coming over from their Protestantism. And it's like, OK, we'll we'll let that slide. But it's she's next level here. And they get it. They get it. Right. So that's important to remember because you're going to read many quotes in the book from people, popes and saints, and you're going to be thinking, it sounds like he's saying that St. Joseph is better than even the Blessed Virgin Mary. That's not, that, that's not what these saints are saying. Trust me, they all know these distinctions. Okay, now here's a classic example, classic example, because remember, Catholics wrote the New Testament, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all those dudes, they were Catholic. So they, they wrote the New Testament inspired by the Holy Spirit, and when we read the New Testament, we need a teaching body to help us know how to interpret things. Because if we take it on our own to interpret some of these things, we're going to be in big trouble. Because there's some things in the New Testament that our Lord and Savior meant very literally. Like, for example, when he said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you don't have life. That's not symbolic. That's not figurative. That's literal. Lamb of God, he's sacramentalized this, and we can consume his body and blood now. That's to be taken literally. And that's been the teaching of the church from the beginning. But <clears throat> there are certain things that our Lord did not mean to be taken literally, but in a figurative or in a teaching way. For example, now I can't see you. You can see me. But, you know, if I could see you, 
probably all of you are looking at me. You're not just hearing me. Maybe some of you are, you know, you have some kind of handicap in your eyes and you can't see or something like that, no fault of your own. But most of you are probably looking at me. And most of you probably have both of your hands. So let me ask you this. When our Lord says, if, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Did you pluck out your eyes? No, you didn't. When our Lord says, if your, hand, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. All of you have sinned through your eyes and your hands. We're sinners. I have done the same. But we know that you know the church says, hold on now, you're not to do this. There were actually, I don't I won't get into the details, but there was actually one member of the early church, and the reason that he's not a saint, his name was Origen, that dude lopped off a certain member of his body because he kept sinning through it. And the church said, yeah, that's not what Jesus meant. Okay, you, you, you may have desired to turn away from sin, and that's good, but you went too far there. This is why we have our eyes still and our hands because there's certain things we don't take literally. And the church says to us, okay, these, these kind of things we don't take literally. It's meant to be a te something teaching. The Lord is emphasizing something, but don't chop off your hands and pluck out your eyes. Well, how about this? How are we to interpret this? In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus says something very interesting. Because I've had people, you know, when I say that St. Joseph is the greatest saint after the Blessed Virgin Mary, some people are like, oh, hold on, Father, gotcha. You're a heretic. I gotcha. Because in the Gospel of Luke, it says, Jesus says, I tell you, among those born of women, no one is greater than John the Baptist. Ha ha. Gotcha, Father. Right? I'm calling the Pope. <laughs> now, well, all right. Yes, our Lord says that. But think this through. Okay, and this is what the church has taught from the beginning. Think this through. Jesus himself was born of a woman, Our Lady. Our Lady herself was born of a woman, her mother, St. Anne. So is Jesus saying that John the Baptist is greater than Jesus himself or the Blessed Virgin Mary? Of course not. Remember, it's the church who tells us there are certain things you in interpret literally and certain things that are meant for, for like emphasis or a certain teaching. Jesus loves St. John the Baptist. He's actually related to him. And he knows his great role as the forerunner of the Messiah. And he's, he's, he's acknowledging that. But what a lot of people fail to do is to read the entire passage from the Gospel of Luke. Because this is what it says. This is what it says. I tell you, among those born of women, no one is greater than John the Baptist. Yet, the least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Oh, there is that second part of that verse, huh? Wow. So actually, everybody is greater than John the Baptist in the kingdom of heaven. And that's fascinating. So what's going on there? What's, 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 what's the cryptic kind of stuff? Well, our Lord is highlighting that John the Baptist is understood as the greatest man up to that point in a certain sense, because our Lord is highlighting that John the Baptist is the best man. You know, we know what in a wedding. What do you call the, 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 the friend of the bridegroom who's given a certain privilege uh, at the wedding? You call him the best man. Well, that's what Jesus is saying about John the Baptist. That's why when, when, when our Lord launches his public ministry at the wedding feast of Cana, it's right after that that John the Baptist himself says that he is the friend of the bridegroom. And you know, sometimes our, our translations are not the greatest. And many translations, especially in Europe, and the one that they use at the Vatican, do you know what it says? It, it doesn't say that John the Baptist is referring to himself as the friend of the bridegroom. Do you know what it says? He says, I am the best man. Because you can, that's a valid translation. That, that ancient phrase, whatever it is in the Greek, I don't have it in front of me, it can mean the best man, like at a wedding. That's why Jesus is saying, of those born a woman, none is greater than John. Because he's the best man at the wedding of the Messiah. This is so profound theologically, you know, when you understand it this way. Because our Lord certainly does not mean that John the Baptist is greater than our Lord himself or the Blessed Virgin Mary. And, as the church will teach us, not even St. Joseph. Remember, John the Baptist was not the father of Jesus. 
it's the father, a father, it comes with certain privileges and, and, and rights and, and a dignity. And in the case of St. Joseph, an extreme dignity. You know, God doesn't call, uh, didn't call John the Baptist his father. God never referred to any angel, you know, as, as, as his father, but only one man. And that's the great St. Joseph. He is the greatest after the Blessed Virgin Mary. And here's the other thing. How can Jesus say everyone in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John the Baptist? How is that? How about the people that got in at the last minute, lived a really sinful life, and then, you know, accepted God's mercy, praise the Lord, and, and slipped into paradise? What about those guys? I mean, John the Baptist, he lived on locusts and honey, man, all of his life, and then had his head chopped off. Isn't he greater than, than John the Baptist? In the, or isn't John the Baptist greater than some of these other people in the kingdom of heaven? Well, what our Lord is getting at there is that John the Baptist was the best man at the wedding. But who's better at a wedding, the best man or the bride? The bride. See, in heaven, we're all espoused to God. Our souls are spiritually espoused to God. We are the spouse of the Almighty in paradise, which far out seeds for all of us, even the least in the kingdom of heaven, than the best man at the wedding. That's what the, we're getting at here. And that's what the church has been trying to tell us for 2,000 years. But people still trip on, up on that and say, whoa, John the Baptist is better. Nope. No, he's not. It's St. Joseph, who is the greatest saint after the Blessed Virgin Mary. He's so great, actually, that as this theology of St. Joseph has developed, we've come to understand now that St. Joseph is even greater than the angels, all of them, of the highest choir. You know, this is something that, again, another doctoral dissertation, because we're talking about his intimate union with our Lord and with Our Lady that gives him a dignity that is greater than all, even the angels. Again, God doesn't obey angels, but God obeyed Joseph because he played that role of being the father of the Messiah, the father of Jesus Christ. God never called any angel father, but God called Joseph father. And that dignity, that close union is so profound, is so profound that if you get the chance, and you should, after you do this consecration, I, I could have put a lot of articles in here, especially from some, some great French bishops in the past, uh, from some guys, uh, their names, I, I don't have a lot of them in the book, but there's guys named Suarez and all these other guys that talk about this stuff, of the dignity and the union of St. Joseph with what's called the hypostatic union which is basically a fancy way of saying the incarnation where God takes on human nature in order to save us. Mary, our blessed lady was required physically for this. She gave flesh to the God man. So she was physically necessary for this. St. Joseph was not physically necessary for this because he's not the biological father of Jesus Christ. However, as we have developed this understanding of the greatness of St. Joseph and his role, it's very important for everybody to know that the God-man took on human nature within the context of the already existing marriage between Mary and Joseph. See, a lot of people think that Mary was an unwed mother when the angel came to her. She was not. Oh, how it kills me. When I hear a priest say this in a homily, that Mary was an unwed woman. She was not. She was already in a marriage with Joseph. The Jewish marriage had two phases. They were in the first phase, which was already a marriage. It wasn't like it was an engagement, like, you know, they could call it off. No, they were already married. It's just they weren't living together. The second phase of a Jewish marriage at that time, 2,000 years ago, the second phase was when they moved in together. But they were already married when the angel came to her. See, this is very important because the angel waited to come to the Blessed Virgin Mary until she was already married to Joseph, which shows us something great about St. Joseph, that in a certain sense, in a certain sense, the incarnation was dependent upon the marriage, which means Joseph is great. Joseph is great. He wouldn't be required physically for the incarnation, but God was going to use his marriage. God was going to use his his. His, his manhood, his masculinity to be the model for his eternal son. 
So this great dignity, this close union, super close union of St. Joseph with the hypostatic union with, with the incarnation is what now we've, we're coming to understand. In the back of the book, I've got an incredible article from a great theologian from the early 20th century, Father Gary, uh, Reginald Gary Goulagrange, a Dominican. What a theologian. He taught St. John Paul II at the Angelicum in Rome. I have an article from uh, his book on the Blessed Virgin Mary, but the article is about St. Joseph in the back. If you get a chance, read that. It's a little deep theologically. Good Dominicans are like that. Um, it talks about this preeminent sanctity of St. Joseph. And this is what I'm talking about when I'm, when I'm, when I'm saying that we're living in the era of St. Joseph. And if, if we can get theologians... And we don't, sadly, we don't have a lot of theologians who think like this today. People are just into feelings and sentiments and stuff like that. And we don't get these guys systematically making distinctions and breaking this stuff down for us. But we need this kind of stuff because then we could get some kind of doctrinal statement about St. Joseph and, and how God used him and, and, and needed him, uh, you know, in, in a way that he did need Our Lady, but that still needed him in his role as father and husband and his masculine identity for the, the shaping of the God-man. I mean, this is huge. I hope you guys know what I'm talking about here. And I'm sorry if I'm going way off into deep theology stuff, but this is profound. This is so profound. And this is why St. Joseph is the greatest saint after the Blessed Virgin Mary. And by the way, tons of these quotes are from saints and doctors of the church. Lots and lots of them, especially like St. Lawrence of Brindisi. Wow, this dude, holy moly, man. You know what they called this guy? He lived, uh, you know, during the time and after the Protestant, you know, revolt. It really wasn't a reformation. It was a bunch of arrogant dudes who thought they knew better and tried to reform it by, you know, doing their own way, which is always an error, always an error. You got to do it from within and not start breaking out and doing it on your own. So he was called the hammer of the heretics, St. Lawrence of Brindisi, because this guy was like intellectually on the money and he was just and but he was so pious he was so awesome so i've got some great quotes from him in here and a lot of these quotes by the way i guarantee you that most people are reading this stuff they've never seen these quotes the book that i got to put these quotes in was printed in india i, I don't know why people in the united states or some other place english-speaking places didn't want to publish stuff on saint lawrence of brindisi probably because he's hardcore you know, a lot of people today, they read this stuff and, you know, they're triggered because he's like calling it out, man. He's calling it what it is. I mean, he, he's, he's, he's just calling a spade a spade. And that's what we need. Um, and so that's what he did centuries ago. But people are turned off by, you know, his, his language. I love it. Um, I wish we had a lot more prelates who spoke that way today because it would be clear. We wouldn't be ambiguous. We wouldn't be living like, hmm, I wonder. No, me wondering. Let daddy tell you, let your spiritual father tell you with total clarity what's right, what's wrong, what's black, what's white, what's what's truth, what's false. But today we got so many people who are just, you know, dancing around. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. All right, I'm going off on a thing here. You always got to stay on focus, father. Stay on focus. All right. So he's one of those great ones. St. Uh, Leonard of Port, Port Maurice is another one. Oh, man, listen to this. He says, rejoice, devout servants of St. Joseph. For you are close to paradise. The ladder leading up to it has but three rungs. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. I love those kind of quotes, man. All right, so I'm going to get into this quick. Um, again, it's, it's uh, distinctions of categories that theologians and saints have made to talk about what I've been explaining to you. But this comes from the Greek, okay? Because some of these other languages, like Latin and Greek, you can get real precise and some of these things. So they said that for God, we, we give adoration, which is a no-brainer, right? We adore him. And so that's called latria. And you'll find that in classical writings of theology, latria, to God alone. After that is what's called hyperdulia. So what we're talking about there, dulia is like reverence. Hyper, as you know, is like super. You know, if they could use the word we would use today, super. So hyperdulia means highest reverence, and that's for Our Lady, and Our Lady alone. No other saint and no angel gets hyperdulia. That's why she's got that unique category that's all hers. Now, for a long time, a lot of people <coughs> thought, well, dulia is just for everybody else. 
So you can lop in there the Angels and then the Saints, you know, and we'll just cl all in, un under that umbrella of Dulia. But as this stuff has developed with St. Joseph, beginning in the, you know, medieval era, period of church history, and then coming now, it's, it's become very clear that it's pretty much universally understood that we refer to St. Joseph with Dulia, with reverence, but remember, he's the greatest among all the other saints. He gets proto-Dulia, meaning the first revered among all the others. That includes the saints and the angels. Wow. So that's a real clear, it's on page 89, uh, a clear distinctions there. If anybody, you know, um, is interested in, in, in that, you can take a picture of it with your phone, carry it around in case somebody comes up to you and says, hey, you can go, oh, here, no, right here, right here. Okay. All right. So uh, going down, I bring up, start bringing up saints who were really, in a special way, promoters of St. Joseph and his greatness. And one of the greatest is St. Teresa of Avila. I've talked about that before. She really loved St. Joseph, and she experienced this firsthand because she relied upon him for many things in her own life, protecting her virtue. At one point, she kind of gives a little cryptic thing, saying that maybe she, you know, was in a very serious situation and could have fallen, but St. Joseph came to her rescue and protected her, her, um, her, uh, what, how do, I forget how he says, how she says it, her honor which to me probably meant, you know, something she was being tempted in the area of perhaps lust or something like that. Uh, I don't know. I don't put words in her mouth. Forgive me, St. Teresa of Avila, if I am. But that's what, how I took it. Um, and she relied upon him for helping her renew, you know, the Carmelites. She named all of her reformed Carmel, uh, convents after St. Joseph because she knew his power. And she actually challenged people to attest. She said, if you don't believe me, that St. Joseph has this ability, this unique power of intercession, then I challenge you to try it for yourself. That's what she says. And on page uh, 90, I have a long quote about that. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you. If you get a chance, well, you need to read it, obviously, if you're doing the program. Um, it's a really beautiful one from her. If that's not good enough, let's go to the greatest theologian to ever live, St. Thomas Aquinas, the angelic doctor, right? The great Dominican. He says this, there are many saints to whom God has given the power to assist us in the necessities of life. But the power given to St. Joseph is unlimited. It extends to all our needs. And all those who invoke him with confidence are sure to be heard. Wow. That's St. Thomas Aquinas. Now, everything that we ask of St. Joseph has to be in accord with God's will. Otherwise, I would own Tahiti right now. And, you know, I mean... We got to have what God wants for us, and he knows what's best for us. We don't always get what we want, just like you know if you're you're a parent, you know that when you take your child through, you know, Walmart or whatever, and they're seeing plastic toys, you know, maybe you'll get them one, maybe, but you just don't start throwing all the toys into the thing. You know, there, there's a place. They, they got to learn. They got to learn. Okay. Now, I go through and I list what I consider to be, and there could be more, but in my research, I discovered 26, what I call champions of St. Joseph, the ones who throughout church history who have really championed and promoted him in a greater way than others. So let me read those to you uh, quickly. St. Bernardine of Siena, St. Lawrence of Brindisi, St. Teresa of Avila, St. Francis de Sales, Venerable Mary of Agreda, St. Alphonsus Liguori, Blessed William Joseph Chaminade, Blessed Maria Repetto, you probably haven't heard of her, pretty amazing woman. St. Peter Julian Imard, Blessed John Joseph Latast, we're going to learn a lot about him later. Uh, it's because of him that we have St. Joseph as the patron of the Universal Church, great Dominican. St. Leonardo Morialdo, St. Luigi Guanella, Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich, St. Joseph Morello, another great one. His, uh, Blessed Maria Teresa of St. Joseph, remember we just learned about her the other day. Blessed Petra of St. Joseph. She's the great one from Spain who founded uh, a uh, shrine to St. Joseph in Spain. And was she was called the greatest apostle of St. Joseph of the 19th century. Because remember, the 20th century greatest apostle was St. Andre Bassett. Then you get Venerable Fulton Sheen. Oh, he loved St. Joseph. St. Jose Maria Escrivá. Mm, great stuff. And then Blessed Gabriel Allegra, the one I mentioned at the beginning from Sicily, who went to China and translated the Bible. 
So those are the main ones of the, the saints. And then I list some popes. And the list of popes is a lot shorter because, remember, this stuff has been developing. And the popes, you know, only recently started really highlighting St. Joseph. It really only began with the pontificate of Blessed Pope Pius IX in the uh, mid-19th century. So you got Pius IX, you got Leo the Thirteenth. Remember, he wrote the first, first encyclical on St. Joseph in 1889. Pope Benedict XV, he's the one who put Blessed be St. Joseph, her most chaste spouse, into the divine praises. If you go to benediction, you know, we pray the divine praises. He's the one who put St. Joseph in the divine praises. Venerable Pius XII, that's where we get the Feast of St. Joseph the Worker from him, right? St. Pope John the Twenty Third. Uh, yeah, he, he really loved St. Joseph. We'll talk more about that later. And then St. John Paul II. Now, what I wanted to share with you guys too, you probably have skipped ahead. I don't know anybody who doesn't skip ahead in this book. A lot of people tell me, Father, I can't put the thing down. You give us these short readings and I want to keep reading and I'm already on page 200. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, okay, so I want you to turn, if you have the book, to page 318 and 319. Because I commissioned art about these 26 saints and popes. And this particular image is called St. Joseph, Terror of Demons, but it shows him those 26 champions. And you can buy this canvas image. You can buy this on the website, consecration to St. Joseph.org. And it lists them on the opposite page uh, here. Okay. Now, this is the only place where they're listed. It's not on the internet. So if you want to find out who these people are, you have to go over here and it tells you they're like one, two, three, four, five, you know, all of them are listed. And it, and it shows them. This uh, young lady, Bernadette, she did this image for me, and she is an incredible artist. Um, and so they're all presented there. And that image of St. Joseph, you'll recognize that one, because that's that image, I, the newer image, that she extracted from this larger one. And she did some different things with the colors and, and a few other things. And so we have that new canvas image of St. Joseph, Terror of Demons, which is based off of, of this one. So check that out. This is a unique, I mean, all of these commissioned art pieces are unique. In the, you're not going to find them anywhere else in the world like this. And if you're an artist or a sculptor or something, I want to encourage you, do this kind of stuff. Paint St. Joseph in a masculine way, in a strong way, in, a, in, a, in, in, in you know, a way that depicts him that men will look to him and go, I want to be like that. I, I want to be, I want to, I want to imitate him in that. I want to, I want to be close to that kind of leadership, that servant leadership that I'm seeing depicted in this image. So anyway, all right, so let's go back to the main text on page uh, 91. All right, here's probably one of the greatest quotes, statements ever made on St. Joseph. And Pope Leo the Thirteenth. it's so profound. Again, doctoral dissertation on this. He says, the dignity of the mother of God is so elevated that there can be no higher, no, be no higher created one. But since St. Joseph, remember what I've been saying, was united to the Blessed Virgin by the conjugal bond. That doesn't mean marital relations. A lot of people have been tripping out on that. They email me like, what are you saying? What is he saying? I'm, he's not saying what you're thinking. It doesn't mean they have marital relations. Conjugal bond just means marital bond. It doesn't mean um, <clears throat> marital relations. So by the conjugal bond, there is no doubt that he approached nearer than any other, including the angels, to that super eminent dignity of hers by which the mother of God surpasses all created natures. That includes the angels. It don't matter how high in the choir that they are. Mary and Joseph are greater in dignity. That is so profound. He says conjugal union. Remember, that doesn't mean marital relations. It means marital bond. Mar they had a marriage. Conjugal union is the greatest of all. By its very nature, it is accompanied by a reciprocal communication of the goods of the spouses. If then God gave St. Joseph to Mary to be her spouse, he certainly did not give him merely as a companion in life, a witness of her virginity, a guardian of her honor, but he made him also participate by the conjugal bond, by their marriage, in the eminent dignity, which was hers. Drop the pontifical mic. Boom! There it is, my friends. 
that is the foundation right there for us to actually develop doctrines and dogmas about the great St. Joseph. About the great St. Joseph. Oh man, do we need this today. I'm so sorry I'm getting so excited about this because this pumps me up. This is what changes stuff. This is what renews society. This is what renews the church when we get stuff like this, statement like this. He cranked that statement out in 1889. And we're over 100, going 130 years or something after that. This stuff is so profound. Oh man, I'm so excited about this stuff. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read you two quotes from two of my favorite holy people. Blessed Bartolo Longo, O oh God, the glory of Joseph is known only by you and your angels. Men are not worthy to know it. This admirable saint is higher than the heavenly spirits. St. George Preca from the island of Malta. The dignity of St. Joseph is so great that none can be greater. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Okay. I think we're going to wrap it up there. I'm going to pray the litany of St. Joseph with you. Otherwise, we're going to be here all night. Um, so let's do that. Remember, turn to page 233 if you have the hard copy. Okay, so let us begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, hear us. Christ, graciously hear us. God, the Father of heaven, have mercy on us. God, the Son, Redeemer of the world, have mercy on us. God, the Holy Spirit, have mercy on us. Holy Trinity, one God, have mercy on us. Holy Mary, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Noble offspring of David, pray for us. Light of patriarchs, pray for us. Spouse of the Mother of God, pray for us. Chaste guardian of the Virgin, pray for us. Foster father of the Son of God, pray for us. Zealous defender of Christ, pray for us. Head of the Holy Family, pray for us. Joseph most just, pray for us. Joseph most chaste, pray for us. Joseph most prudent, pray for us. Joseph most courageous, pray for us. Joseph most obedient, pray for us. Joseph most faithful, pray for us. Mirror of patience, pray for us. Lover of poverty, pray for us. Model of workmen, pray for us. Glory of domestic life, pray for us. Guardian of virgins, pray for us. Pillar of families, pray for us. Comfort of the afflicted, pray for us. Hope of the sick, pray for us. Patron of the dying, pray for us. Terror of demons, pray for us. Protector of the Holy Church, pray for us. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, spare us, O Lord. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, graciously hear us, O Lord. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. He has made him Lord of his household and prince over all his possessions. Let us pray. O God, who in your loving providence chose blessed Joseph to be the spouse of your most holy mother, grant us the favor of having him for our intercessor in heaven, whom on earth we venerate as our protector, you who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Heavenly Father, we praise you. We adore you. We worship you. We thank you for the greatness that you have given to St. Joseph. Higher than all other saints. Higher than the angels. Only less than Jesus and Mary. Oh, St. Joseph, our spiritual father, we come to you. We fly to you. We ask you to cover us, cloak us with your paternal protection. We need you in these difficult times. We need a renewal of family life. We need a renewal in marriages. We need a renewal in the priesthood. We need a renewal in the church. Oh, great St. Joseph, come to our aid. Hear us as your children, as your sons and daughters, and bring us closer to Jesus. And my friends, may Almighty God bless you, your intentions, your family members, especially for conversions. Blessing of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.